Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is another episode of todebate.eu, your debating podcast. I'm today with the same host, the same co-host as ever for the past two and a half years. Dirk, how are you today? And for once, I pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, you, you managed that in the past already as well. So Yeah, I, once. Once. In, once. Or That's twice. the second yeah. time. Whatever. Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing very, very well. And uh, I think... We had a bit of a slow start this year, haven't we? Uh, we have well, to that's find back you were our a, weekly rhythm. That's true, but that's also because you were on a shopping spree, right? You were trying to find the latest electronic gear, which you still did not have to be able to record this podcast. So I guess you traveled all around Europe and Latin America last year, at the end of last year, uh, yeah. to be able to find that latest ultrasound, supersonic, whatever it is that you're buying. Yeah, sure, sure. I bought, I bought high-tech gear in Cuba, which is where <laughs> I was last year. Um, so, dear listeners, stay with us. We're going to talk not about Cuba today, but very close to Cuba. In fact, Cuba has been defending the legitimate, or at least the elected president of Venezuela. And we're going to talk about something which is happening and unfolding at the moment and probably not going to be resolved completely before a few weeks, if not a few months, maybe a few years, if you compare the situation of Venezuela to another country. And the motion today is going to be, it's not acceptable that the US and most of Europe would recognize a non-elected, self-declared president in Venezuela. The flip of the coin, as usual, because we flip the coin to decide sides, has decided that I will be in favor of that motion. I will defend that it's not acceptable to recognize or to legitimize a non-elected uh, candidate, president uh, in a country. And Dirk, you will be against. So you'll say it's totally fine for the US and Europe and other countries to recognize this non-elected person. Exactly. That's it. We can get started whenever you're ready. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. So, uh, we have that conflict unfolding in Venezuela. That's actually not that new. Uh, there has been quite a crisis for, well, almost a decade now. So Maduro, the current, still not maybe president of Venezuela, that's one point that we're going to argue over, uh, arguably uh, ruined Venezuela the past years with his policies. And uh, just to describe to the listeners who are not that plugged in, what happened uh, was an election that is disputed by the opposition. And the opposition now uh, following through with declaring the leader of the house chamber, if you will, of Venezuela, the interim's president with the task to start a new election process to elect a government. That's the situation we are in. And as our motion suggests, the EU and the US and several others jumped to accept that position and accepted that uh, House leader to be the, the interim president. Now, my argument is going to be uh, threefold, really. First off, I would ar will argue that Maduro actually lost legitimacy a long time ago. So he has not the backing of the people. And the election process that uh, brought him back into power, as he claims, is severely flawed and therefore the the house speaker was right in following the venezuelan law by declaring himself president to kick off another election process argument number two you claim he's a non-elected president actually the guy was elected into the position that he was in and right now he just follows the laws on the book you can have uh, argument over the interpretation of those laws, but he's not completely illegitimate. It's not uh, somebody who just jumps to the occasion. He's somebody who was elected into the position that allowed him to self-declare. And number three really is the question if the US and Europe are allowed to recognize somebody like this. And I will make a point that they are perfectly fine. They can, they can recognize whoever. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his argument. Imagine if Europe had said, we don't recognize Trump. You know what? The elections were too close. There was some fraud and the Russians interfered. We recognize Hillary Clinton or whomever is next in line according to the law of the Constitution. It just would not happen. 
So why do we feel it's okay to do that with another country just because they're Venezuela or some ex-colony? Why are we having, again, that patronizing attitude just because they're nations that are weaker economically, so it's just so much easier to criticize them? It's completely hypocritical. Are the U.S. calling for free and fair elections in China? Funny, we're not hearing the U.S. threaten China with all options on the table in case China does not comply. In fact, we know it's controversial this decision to recognize a non-elected person as the president of Venezuela. Why? Because Russia and China do not recognize that person as president. And before you say, oh, it's the usual suspects, Russia and China, don't forget other countries also did not recognize uh, Guaido. Mexico, South Africa, Bolivia, Uruguay, Iran, and many European countries as well. Italy, Ireland, Norway, Greece, Cyprus. Let the people decide. Let the people of Venezuela decide. Whether it's elections or mass protests or violence, it's not our business. It's not for any foreign power, especially to decide what's to happen in another country. By the way, it's not black or white. They're just not democracies on one side and authoritarian, re authoritarian regimes on the other. It's a spectrum. Is the U.S. in any way legitimate to give democracy lessons to others? What about all the gerrymandering in its own elections? What about its constant interference in Iraq, Afghanistan, or in the past in Nicaragua, not far away from Venezuela or Vietnam, always ending up in disaster. At the very least, what we can do as Europeans or Americans is encourage existing leaders of the assembly of the country to call for new elections. Don't threaten them by saying you won't recognize them and recognize someone who is not elected. You can apply a number of sanctions, as the US and other countries have done, financial san sanctions, international sanctions, and that is a way to put pressure. But not recognizing and being radical, as I'm going to explain it in my second piece afterwards, is actually a very radical and extreme approach, which is not going to resolve anything. So no, it's not acceptable for the US and Europe or any other country to recognize a non-elected person as the president of Venezuela. <laughs> And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. Fun argument. Remind me, when did Hillary declare that the election was illegal and she actually is the elected president? I cannot remember. That seemed to have, I seem to have missed that piece of news because that would have been the starting point of, of accepting or not accepting any decision uh, by the US electorate. But the fact of the matter is Hillary Clinton accepted defeat. And Trump was the elected president. Therefore, we all, whether we like it or not, live with that decision by the U.S. people. What's happening in Venezuela is actually following the laws in Venezuela. And what's happening in Venezuela um, is that there are two leaders that can make a credible claim that they are right to be president of that country. And what is right now happening is exactly what you demanded. The leader of the opposition party, the guy self-declaring president, to use your words, he basically calls for a proper election. Because what unfolded before this uh, situation came to be is that Maduro tried to kill off the constitution and change the constitution in a way that, uh, that solidifies his power and grip on the presidential seat. As a result, the opposition called for a boycott of this election, which then happened. As a result... Uh, Maduro claimed that he was elected with a massive majority, which was not a reality because the people in Venezuela are pretty oppressed and by now are pretty much crisis ridden. And as a result of that, the opposition says this election has not been, been legitimate. They call for having an election based on the current constitution, based on the current system. And since Maduro is not doing that, They, they, they basically use their own law to, to um, enforce their power struggle. So the guy is a legitimate elected person in an official position and he follows the law to, to kick off an election process. Exactly what you ask for. And I do think that the EU and the US and what have you, they are right to pick the, uh, the president that they think is legitimately in power. And they are also right to pick the president they believe is kicking off the much needed election and the much needed change in that country. Next point. Is Venezuela actually a democracy? That stands to reason. Actually, it's a military dictatorship of sorts. So they do have elections, they do have presidents, but nothing, nothing happens in Venezuela if the military is not backing it. So I would be careful about this as well. 
Are we right to pick our battles? Are we right to pick the leaders we want to work with? I think every country has a right to do that and has done so in the past. And the same is true for Venezuela and the current situation. The US and large parts of the EU have a vital interest to kick off elections there, to uh, lower the power of the military in Venezuela and to stabilize that country. And that's what they try to accomplish by, by accepting the current situation. <laughs> And now on to Sebastian. You said Maduro ruined the country for the past decade. I don't disagree. And I'm not even saying he's a good guy. I'm only saying it's not for us, Europeans and Americans, to suddenly decide who is another country's head of state. Doesn't it sound crazy to you, dear smart listeners of our podcast? He lost legitimacy. Well, that's you know debatable. There were elections. In fact, The elections were last May. Uh, hello, you could have woken up back then, you being the population or foreign countries uh, who are now designating the parliament's head as the legitimate president. Why now suddenly? Why eight months down the line? Hello? like It's just like weird coincidences. Uh, we talked about Clinton and I was obviously joking about this aspect and she, of course, did not self-declare herself as president, but hang on. Are we just waiting for people to self-declare because it's the law, but nobody appointed them, right? The Constitution or the Supreme Court, which, fair enough, is under uh, Maduro's helm, probably, has not said we're going to apply the law, right? He just self-declares. Are we just waiting for people to self-declare to suddenly say, oh, yeah, fine, you're the president, even if it's legal or not? Now, I want to talk a bit more and longer on the aspect of calling for proper elections. Yes, I agree. Countries can ask for proper elections. That's why Ireland and Italy are doing. They're asking for elections, but they're not recognizing at the same time someone who is not elected. And in any case, and here I'm, I'm going to have a longer piece. Fine. You recognize uh, Guaido as uh, the head of state. Then what? Do you have a plan for what's next? Because Maduro has not stepped down. The military is on his side. So are we actually inviting for both sides to start fighting? especially if Maduro thinks he was he has no way out or no exit from that situation. This is terribly short-term thinking. What will it change for us, Europeans and Americans, to be so radical in our attitude except making Maduro even more hardened in his position? If instead we had adopted a more realistic and subtle approach, just like Ireland is having, or Italy, which is calling for free and fair elections, then perhaps we could hope for some change to take effect, but being radical will not help. Time will tell. Of course, time will tell. That will be interesting to re-listen to that debate after the situation has resolved, one way or another. But if anything, Guaido's recognition as president, in my opinion, was premature. Another sad example and parallel to what I'm describing here is Syria. Obama asked Bashar al-Assad to step down. When? In 2011. Where in 2019, has Bashar al-Assad stepped down? Uh, I don't think so, right? So we have past examples. We know that just doesn't happen by just deciding who's the head of state for another country. So let's be realistic. The world is as it is. So we need to deal and negotiate with people with whom we don't agree, with bad people, with evil people. They're just in place. And I'll conclude again by reminding our listeners, why are we not having the same attitude with China? Are there free and fair elections in China? I think most people would agree that's not the case. So why this hypocrisy? So no, let's not start having a double standard. And I don't think it's acceptable for anyone to recognize a non-elected, self-declared president in Venezuela. Final statements. Dirk goes first. Sebastian, study up on Venezuela and what happens there. Because the guy didn't self-declare a full-fledged presidency. He's an interim president with the task you called for, kicking off elections. So by supporting him, you actually do exactly what you call for, what Italy is trying to do, Ireland is trying to do. They call for elections in Venezuela. And why did it take eight months? Because they have due process and laws. The guy stepped up as an interim president because the local laws give him that power and because there is a legitimate interpretation that he has an obligation to do so. Now, the EU and the US, yes, they pick sides, but they pick the side of a new election. Will it work? I don't know. But just staying with the status quo probably would not work either. 
It's not the same as you make it sound. It's not just somebody who grips to power. The process itself more or less guarantees that he might, may lose the power in a couple of months because that's what he's stepped up to do. Sebastian. Yes, he has self-declared and he's the interim president. We know how this goes with interim presidents around the world. Interim, which lasts for three decades. That's very funny. Uh, I forgot to bring another example, by the way, about other presidents who ruined their own countries or so-called presidents. Mugabe in Zimbabwe. What happened for 30 years? Nobody complained, at least of foreign powers. And he was over... Uh, and he was thrown out with a coup d'etat, right? Internal coup d'etat, not a foreign military intervention. So again, we have double standards. So there's no reason why we should be this patronizing with Venezuela just because it's weaker in a very terrible state economically. And in fact, this is why so many countries around the planet uh, have decided not to recognize Guaido as the new president. Let the people decide. Let the people of Venezuela decide, not for any other foreign power to say what should happen or not in another country. Existing leaders around the planet can ask uh, for new elections, fine, but let's not have these countries just decide who's the head of state. Let the people of Venezuela decide. Overall, it's not acceptable for any other foreign power to decide who's elected and who's, self, who's the president of that state. Now, what do you really think? Initially, I was surprised with the reaction that we recognize, the non-elected person. Then I, I looked it up before the debate, obviously, as I was, I was reading the news and realized it was indeed the natural legal step. But then I thought back as I was preparing this debate and I thought, well, hang on, fine, it's the law, but who are we outside of Venezuela to apply Venezuelan law, right? Like, fine, we can say this guy should be the interim president, but on what grounds are we doing this in Venezuela and not in other countries where there have been tempered elections? I mean, Venezuela is not the first and last country to have problems with its elections. Russia has problems with its elections. Do we do anything there? Of course not. It's just too powerful a country. So it's just... What bothers me is this double standard, right? So I'm, I, I think I lean towards the stance of Ireland, which is much more neutral. It's to say, you know what, like, have your elections, figure it out. But we're not going to say who's the president or the interim president. I don't know. I think I lean towards that. Yeah, I think in the end it comes down to if if the country believes that they can make a difference. So um, to your point. If we call for new elections in Russia, nobody cares, especially if Europe calls for new elections in Russia. Russia certainly doesn't care, uh, nor do the Russian people, nor have we any way of forcing this. Have we supported opposition leaders in the past? Of course we did. But uh, I think this, this, really, this really comes down to does it change anything? Whereas in a country like Venezuela, uh, where we seem to care... And secondly, there is a moment right now where we actually can make a difference by picking a side. And I think this is the occasion countries raise to. They feel like, oh yeah, all right, Guaido actually can kick off new elections and new elections is what's needed in Venezuela. So that's, they try to help this process by picking the side. We have a right to pick the side we want to work with. I mean, uh, if you have two people that present itself as president, why not picking the one that suits you better? You basically say, I agree that this guy should be the one working with me until you have a proper election and pick somebody else. Isn't that also a legitimate stance? Isn't that also something that we are free to do? And, and you're saying basically for China, we don't want to do this or Russia. Why? Because it, we have no, no, no chance to actually make a difference. It's not working. I mean, so we're can. opportunistic, we're cynical, basically. You're yes. saying just because. I would say world politics is always cynical. Oh, oh, I'm not disagreeing with that, right? But let's be cynical on the, on that on that issue specifically. Yeah, I just like let's choose whatever's more convenient for us. Yeah, that's probably part of the equation. We want to have a, we want to see elections, and we believe that this can trigger elections. That's what it looks like. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I guess I may be more idealistic and more. Uh, yeah, I I guess I I would want us to be less cynical in the way we deal we we work in politics, and that includes other things like you know selling weapons to Saudi Arabia or other countries. Right, same thing. So yeah, I guess it comes down to what kind of 
philosophy in politics we want to have. I agree. And and cynicism then does justify double standards for the reasons you mentioned, right? We just think it's we're not going to change anything in China, so we just shut up, or Saudi Arabia for that matter. Fair enough. I yeah. guess it's a, it's a decision, right? There's no disagreement. It's just a decision which way you want to be. Yeah, and I think in case of China and Russia, we are more the nagging voice. Like uh, every once in a while, poke them. But knowing that we are essentially powerless, we pick other battles to fight. And uh, in case of Venezuela, we we might have a chance to to inflict change. But yeah, you're right. Uh, the question is, do you feel at comf uh, do you feel at ease by being more on the Machiavelli side of things? I wonder also one more thing, because the Guaido guy is 35 years old. He's good looking. And I'm wondering if it had... No, no, I'm serious. I wonder if he had been a 60-year-old Venezuelan uh, opposition leader with some shady background, maybe corruption, maybe past, you know, maybe military, ex-military. Would we have had the same attitude? I was wondering. Because this guy seems... I've read the Wikipedia entry for his biography. Sorry, it's not a fantastic source of information. Uh, but it's the best I could I could use quickly to get a sense of this guy. He doesn't seem to have any anything evil, you know, attached to him or anything bad, any bad history. He's I mean, he's so young anyway, uh, compared to other usual politicians. So I was wondering. It may it, I didn't want to bring it up in the debate because I thought that was like borderline. Anyway, it's not a real argument. But I was wondering, like the guy like mm. seems to be, you know, the young, thriving, energizing like person who used to be a, a student leader would we have had the same attitude if he had if you were a 60 ex general like, with some corruption attached to him it's like the venezuelan version of the obama trudeau yeah exactly exactly yeah i'm, I'm actually i'm seriously thinking you know wondering whether the it would have changed our attitude and same Maybe. thing imagine that the six if it, if he had been 60 year old with up with some scandals attached to him uh and but imagine he were the president of the or the head of the assembly I don't know. I'm just wondering. Yeah, I they, cannot answer that. Probably it would be, maybe it would have been different. Don't know. So let's see how history will unfold in the next few weeks, if it was indeed useful uh, and it will trigger change or not. I'm curious. Yes. It will be interesting. We can have another debate, debating the question if it was a good outcome or not. Should we have picked the side? <laughs> All, All right. right. Thank you for listening. And as usual, you can vote on todebate.eu and you can email us and you can even suggest motions that we can debate in the next few episodes. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Sebastian. And let's talk next time. Stay tuned. Bye. Bye-bye. I'm not. I'm not sure we still know how to do this. We, we, we know how to. We do are this. a bit rusty. <laughs> we'll see about that. I'm not sure when you have done the last uh, recording. When? When was it? That was December, no. You know, I'm in Jakarta tomorrow, and then I'm going on vacation on New Zealand, and after New Zealand, I'm doing that team summit, and then I have to travel through Asia because my my boss is traveling through Asia, and then I don't know where I'm going to be, but it's going to be somewhere that's away, <laughs> away from you. <laughs> Did not see this as any sign of anything. You know? Are you going to the US? Yeah, I'm not going. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I noticed. Oh, there. you mean the mandatory thing for the entire team? Yeah, I'm not going because you're going, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, just, then I'm sick and I'm sorry and I forgot and uh, <laughs> the dog ate my homework. And no, that's I, not, I didn't say that. that. Not yet. I can still <laughs> use that excuse. <laughs>
no, no, no. You're going to be you're going to be stuck with your clones, and then not you have the job at hand to entertain them. Uh huh. That's what's going to be. Your life will be miserable. They will all sit there and say, "I want to read something. I want to do something useful with my time." Sebastian, give me something I want to do, and you will be desperate because computers are doing everything already. Who told you my life prior to clones was not miserable already? <laughs> this, is, this is getting really sad. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Three, two, one. You have two minutes. <clears throat> Thank you for reminding me because I already forgot. I was not <laughs> sure. Was it 20? Was it 30? What was the time that we had to debate? It, uh, surely whenever you debate, it feels like you have at least five minutes. <laughs> because of the depth of my argument. <laughs> that is the point. Thank you. I know you understand what I mean. All right. So, what do you really think? Wait, I have ah, one minute. you have a minute. Yeah, I'm not used to this. <laughs> Give me so, your minute, baby. Uh, 